Welcome back, fellow armchair generals, to what may be the start of the winter war with the Soviets. We are, of course, playing Hearts of Iron 4 with um, Black Ice and playing as Finland. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. I love to see you around more often. So we're going to continue this. The Soviets are currently justifying a war goal against us, which probably means once that happens, they'll go to war. Now, how are we doing? How far are we on this? This is not very far along at all. I want that to build faster, faster, faster. How are we on our resources? Um, okay. Just make sure that we're not importing something that we don't need. Did I say that right? I don't know. Well, I think um, I think I'll be able to get more manpower by once we're at war and instituting some sort of draft. Um, and I want to put the subs out at least to try to keep the Soviets from doing any sort of invasion against my coast. Because I only have two ships and seven subs. Mm, heavy cruisers there. Okay. The Russians demand Karelia, citing the need to create a security buffer for Leningrad. Officials from the Soviet Union have asked for a revision of our borders. They want us to cede Karelia to them. And judging by the buildup of Soviet forces along our border, they will not take no for an answer. How should we respond? Now, um, let, let's talk a little bit about history here and Stalin and whatnot, not about this game that we're playing. Um, yeah, I do think Hitler, Stalin was worried about a security buffer to a major industrial city area. But we see his aggression everywhere, but particularly against the Baltic states. Um, who's invading through Latvia and, Litho and Latvia and Estonia? That was, that was the, for those of you who haven't watched all my other series and who don't know, the ribbon, the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact had both a public and a um, secret elements to it. The public elements scared people enough; they didn't know about the secret elements. The secret elements, of course, um, provided for the carving up of Poland. Basically, um, German German declar declaration of war on Poland and the Soviets' ability to come in and protect the eastern part of that. Now the original, um, and we can click over here, the original um, boundary was sort of this here, the Soviets were going to get here. And originally, um, under the protocols of it, Estonia and Latvia were in the Soviet spheres, and Lithuania were in, was in the um, German sphere. So um, this happened. Um, earlier, because then, then historically did in this game, but um, because this happened before um, Poland was defeated, but um, L Lithuania was exchanged for this part of Poland for Germany. Um, it was you know between the Soviets and that. So now once you've gotten into here and germany's here lithuania or lithuania may be a buffer zone but not really and um so this isn't really a buffer zone and who's a buffer zone and what are they protecting down here with bessarabia really oh odessa yeah that's oh so important no it was just outward aggression of the soviets Okay, this is not pretty. Yeah. Um. So. Um. Just reading the chat, everybody. Um. So what's gonna stop Stalin? 
And if you give in to him, is he ever going to stop? No, I, I, I'm 100% in believing of that because we can look at, at Romania as a case in point. Again, this has already happened too early here, but they take um, this bit of Romania. Romania gives in, but then once they give in, basically they move from being a pro-allies country into the Axis camp. And Germany moves in troops and very much secures the Ploetsi oil fields and basically tells Stalin hands off. Um, after a while in 19, I think it's early 41, I'd have to look it up, but um, Stalin wants to renegotiate and take more territory um, with Germany. Basically, Hitler says, hell no, because that's the way Stalin operates. You give him some, he'll take more. So getting back up to Finland, I think if they had given in and given this sort of section here as a security buffer, he'd go, great, wait for summer. Oh, we need to occupy the rest of Finland. It was because Finns showed their willingness to fight and their effectiveness in fighting that saved Finland. And that's the only thing that, that stops Stalin is the fear of, of attack. And um, I would say that this is the case with Putin today. Putin is not Stalin. Putin does lock up a few um, uh, political dissidents, does kill a few political dissidents. But Putin is not Stalin. There is no massive gulag system in Russia. There is a million plus people in gulags in China right now. Um, and those are Muslims, the Uyghurs. So there, there's a million plus in China right now. All of you, all of you people out there in the world, Putin's evil, Putin's evil, Putin's evil. I yeah, on Twitter just was hearing some stuff yesterday. Oh God. Yeah. No, Putin ain't good. There, everyone's up in arms just because of domestic American politics over Putin. But China's 10 times as worse. You know, so Putin is bad. I'm not disagreeing with anybody that Putin is bad. But on the scale of badness, he's a lightweight, okay? And so we can see here, we see um, Putin... Well, this part of Georgia, right up in here, and um, somewhere out here, I think it is, is sort of little separate republics right now, um, even though generally the world um, and the world doesn't uh, recognize these little separate republics, but they recognize Georgian independence. Well, Putin tries to go in and occupy all of Georgia. Georgia fights. Georgia gets tentative American support. Putin backs down. Um, they're still controlling their little sort of puppet states. Um, Putin moves into the Crimea, and Obama does nothing. But that is after Obama. And no, I'm not here just to slam Obama. Um, people sort of think that at times. I'm simply, you know, because I could be talking about FDR. It, it doesn't matter. It's it's the policies. Obama comes out and does a red line in the sand. Do not use chemical weapons. Saddam, Saddam Hussein uses some chemical weapons. He does nothing. Now, Bush stood up over Georgia. Doesn't stand up over Syria. The Russians come in and occupy Ukraine or, or Crimea. And does app and the West does absolutely nothing now. Um, the Ukraine or Ukraine had yet to get into NATO. Still, it's not in NATO, so that doesn't trigger a major war. But Obama really doesn't say much. So Putin pushes over in here, just sort of right along in here. Obama does a little bit, but the Ukraine now um, somewhat effectively resists but 
Putin isn't getting very effective use. So Putin um, moves in more Russian assets. They shoot down a Dutch commercial airliner in over the airspace somewhere here. The missile clearly comes from the Russian side of the border and shoots it down. No, I don't think. Um, what does Obama have to do with Saddam? No, I'm talking about Obama drawing a line and saying, if you use chemical weapons... Oh, did I say Saddam? Oh, I meant uh, Assad. Sorry, if I said Saddam, I'm, I'm sorry, Django. It was, it was it, Assa, um, Assam. Uh, 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 Assad, sorry. Assad, the, the president of um, Syria. Sorry if I got the names wrong. Um, so Putin shoots down a Dutch commercial airplane flying at commercial altitudes. Yeah, it's over over Russia's territory and over Ukraine territory, but the missile comes from Russian territory. And the world basically does nothing. Shooting down a commercial airplane. Now, when they shut down, shot down a, a U.S. plane, no, it didn't go into war, but trust me, there was real sanctions back there under Reagan. So Obama keeps, I mean, sorry, Putin keeps pushing. Now that Trump's in office, Trump has twice bombed Syria heavily, um, air bases, uh, bombed a bunch of and fought a bunch of Russian mercenaries, not Russian soldiers, but Russian mercenaries that are fighting, you know, um, fighting for uh, Syria, and has actively sold um, offensive weapon systems to Ukraine. And I do believe we are still currently, as I'm making this, involved in joint military exercises in Ukraine, U.S. Ukraine military exercises that were not held at any time under the Obama administration. So we've put U.S. troops into Ukraine right now. I think there's still U.S. troops. I know for a while there were under Obama U.S. troops into the Baltic states. Obama did do that. But um, so Obama was starting to realize that Putin is just pushing and will keep pushing until he stopped. If I were president, probably it'd be a bad thing for the world. I know that. But if I were president, I would go to the Ukrainians and go, hey, yeah, I, I want to exercise a couple of battalions of, of M1 Abrams in your, in your country and do a joint live fire exercise in, in your country, Ukraine. Do you want to do that with us? You can, you can come along and we can do that. And then I would start, yeah, come down here, and then I would drive my live fire exercise um, M1 Abrams down towards Sevastopol, along with some Ukrainian forces. Now, if, because this is inside of internationally recognized Ukrainian territory, if for some reason somebody in this live fire exercise starts shooting at my tanks, I would start shooting back, but only if they start shooting at my tanks and other equipment and I would have the Ukrainian armed forces following along, and anybody they happen to encounter with a weapon, disarm them, like Russian soldiers that happen to be in Crimea, disarm them. And if they shoot back, use my M1 Abrams to shoot at them and make this very clearly out to be a joint exercise inside of Ukrainian territory in the Crimea, and then go to... Um, Putin, do you really want to expand the war outside of this area? Here's a question for you. What would you think of Americans who believe the U.S. should just pull back from most of the world mili um, militarily? Okay. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Well, it would be a bad thing for the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. Wow. It would be a bad thing for the world. Um, I agree that our strategies in countries are bad strategies that don't bring about victory. We've been too long in Afghanistan. Now, we are not losing soldiers in Afghanistan like the Soviets were. 
Okay. The Soviets pull out of Afghanistan because they're defeated. America has not been defeated in Afghanistan. They haven't achieved victory. That's true. But they haven't been defeated. And currently, we recently, you know, there's still a few casualties trickling out. But there may be more casualties, not maybe deaths, but more casualties in the U.S. Armed Forces and other parts of the world that are sort of, you know, people getting hit by cars, you know, or trucks or, you know, other sorts of accidents, military training accidents and other things like that going on than what's happening in Afghanistan now. So there are some casualties, but it's not like we were at our height of our, our involvement there. And it's nothing like the casualty levels of the Soviets in Afghanistan. Similarly to U.S. units in Iraq and Syria, because if you don't know, we have units in Syria now, mostly special forces. So the casualty rates currently are nothing like they were at the height of the Iraq occupation. So should we withdraw from these countries? Yes, if we're unwilling to decide to... Um, have a winning strategy. And that seems to be the case. George Bush, God love him, but he's that sort of American idealist that we can bring democracy to Iraq. And if we just give them democratic votes, they're going to pick good, reasonable democratic governments. Now, they want to vote to see who's in charge and then that, then that, that faction is in charge. They don't want to have they don't want to have pluralistic democracy. It's what faction is going to be in charge, and the losers get to suck it. Okay, and that's what's the case in Afghanistan. Um, so we keep supporting process and not supporting good, um, effective puppets, if you will. We should pick sides. Pick factions in these countries that we militarily invade and go, okay, you, you know, um, whatever your name is, I don't want to do an ethnically um, stereotypical name, but you, you're in charge of the country. If you are effective, you get to stay in charge of the country. But I'm just telling you right now that um, if you're not effective, you're going to get a phone call to tell you to go to the airport and get on an airplane and leave. And if you don't get on that airplane and leave, there will be either an assassination team or a missile strike against your presidential palace. So you will be in charge of your country so long as we think you're effective. And so if you start butchering large groups of the population, that's not being effective. If your country is being overrun by whatever the bad guys are in your country, whether they're communists or um Islamic fundamentalists or whoever the bad guys are, and you're not you're not running your country well. We're going to make the phone call, and you can get to go into exile. That's that's your way out. You'll just get a phone call. There's an air, there's a U.S. Air Force plane waiting at the waiting at the airport. Go get on it, and also have before you make the phone call, of course, have somebody else in mind to, to replace them. You know who, who's going to be number the number the next guy. You don't you don't you don't fire somebody until you know who who's going to replace them. You know, if the guy quits, well, then you got to look around. But um, so pick factions, pick leaders. Uh, and similarly, like, you know, on the Kurds and that kind of thing. If we do that and then back them, we will do better. But we don't do that. We support processes. That is because in America, we have set up a process that works. And... It works because we culturally agree upon it. It works because up until recently, in the last few years, no one was trying to institute massive changes in America. Now, well, obviously it didn't work in 1861 when we go to, into a civil war over slavery, and that was massive changes in America. And so... Yeah, world police, but we don't necessarily need to be um, world referees. You know, we don't have to treat both sides equal in a conflict. We need to pick a side in a conflict. Now, I am also not in favor of Lindsey Graham's foreign policy of 
Is there a war in that country? Can we get into it? Please, please, please. Because I can't imagine in the last 20 years, and I watch American politics pretty damn carefully, in which there's been a war in some country that Lindsey Graham, the senator from South Carolina, doesn't want to intervene in it. You know, whether it's a war between two countries or a civil war or a guerrilla war, and he, he wants to get into any war everywhere. Now, it comes from several motivations, I think, but he wants to get into it. And his other best buddy who, who wanted to get in almost as many wars, John McCain. So they, they're the, they're the, there's a war. We've got to get into it. We've got to solve it. And part of it, I think, comes from truly altru altruistic reasons in that there's a war going on. And if we could just end that war six months earlier, there's going to be less deaths. You know, just, just let's get the war over, you know, the war between North and South Iran. We'll get it over faster because, look, if for better or for worse, had Assad been toppled fast, you might have an Islamic Republic of, of Syria, which may be a bad thing, but all of the deaths that have been going on, now, of course, unless, of course, the Islamic Republic of, of Syria decides to do mass genocide or mass killing, genocide is maybe sort of an overused term, but do mass killings um, of all opposition leaders, then that could be more killings. You know, So you put Mao in charge of China, you're going to get more killings than, than an ongoing civil war in China. But So you may or may not um, get less killings. But generally speaking, if you end the war, you're going to have less deaths if you end the war quicker. The Kurds may be, but um, they've been holding on for a few years now, their AZADs. And they've had one really good leader. But, um, you know, they're still holding on. I would agree if I were them, I'd try to fight my way to the sea. But that's another, another thing. Um, so... You know, the U.S., sh just because there's a war somewhere, the U.S. should not be involved. But the U.S. does need to, to deal with things, I think. And so, and the people who want us out of, and I, and I get, you know, wh why, why should we leave a place like Iraq? We're still in Germany. We're still in South Korea. We're even still in Japan. That's mostly a naval base type operation, but in Okinawa. Um, so yeah, since World War II, we're still in Germany. And since Korea, we're still in South Korea. It is not necessary for the U.S. to leave. The, the point is, should the U.S. be putting frontline troops on the ongoing civil war inside of Iraq? No. But that's different than guarding... Some high-value installations, that's different than having a security company around some foreign forward air, uh, um, forward uh, observers for, the air, for airstrikes. You know, there's sort of limited participation, sure. And that's sort of where I guess I come down on it. Is, but we need to pick a side. And unfortunately, some of the people that we picked, like in Iraq, are really more in line with Iran. And... Some of that stuff is doing really stupidly done. Well, the Kurds are an interesting sort of powder keg here. Um, The, if you have the willingness to fight, it's hard to suppress you. So we have Kurds fighting in Turkey. We have Kurds fighting in Iran. We have Kurds fighting in Syria. And we have Kurds fighting in Iraq. Now, some of these populations are isolated and small. Some of these populations are, you know, organized together. 
for several reasons, I support an independent Kurdistan. I think it would be a good idea. From a pure geopolitical power play, it would be a very good idea for America because if you were to have a country there that is dependent upon um, American backing to exist, and the Kurds, from my understanding, you know, seem to be building up their, their part of Iraq very well. So they seem to be a reasonably good governing group. Good governance is important to me. So they wouldn't they wouldn't be monsters and you know whatnot. And so they would be be a good ally for us. And which would then give the US strong basing capabilities here to to affect things. Where the um, Sunni Arabs in in Iraq really don't like us because they're the old Saddam faction. The Shia Arabs in the south did sort of like us, but um, because there is a real Arab-Persian divide in the world, but the Iranians have been effective in subverting the Shia Arabs in the south of Iraq. And so they, um, you know, they're no longer a reliable ally. See, so like another very quiet but very reliable American ally is Kuwait. Because, yeah, we saved their butt, and they're thankful for that. But they are one of, if, and I don't know, maybe JP or somebody else knows better, but um, they seem to be one of the more liberal um, Arab states, particularly where it comes for from women and whatnot. Not that they, not that I'm not suggesting or whatever. Oh, they're democratic. That isn't the point. I mean, generally a, a liberal society. Um, but they know that probably Saudi Arabia isn't waiting to gobble them up just because Saudi Arabia really doesn't do that. Now, yeah, I know Saudi Arabia is fighting a war down here, but that is because Iran stoked the war and started the war basically down there by starting a, a faction in there. So Saudi Arabia really isn't trying to create greater Saudi Arabia. They're trying to maintain their kingdom and maintain puppet states around them. And Kuwait might sort of be that to some degree. But they realize that Saudi Arabia, because of what Saddam did to Kuwait, isn't going to defend Kuwait effectively against anybody. Whether it's whatever new Iraq might be, or South Iraq might be, or the greater Iranian empire as it grows, is not going to protect Kuwait. And so the U.S., I still think, has several battalions of M1 Abrams tanks forward deployed and other things out into, into desert camps out there so that all we have to do is fly in the American personnel and we are ready for war. And so we maintain that in um with kuwait and kuwait is quietly very much a um, supporter of whatever the u.s is going to do in the region because they know that without the u.s it's just a, a matter of a countdown to when they disappear Let's see um turkey couldn't finish that off themselves Yeah, and I think you agree. I, I agree with you. It's it's the price that it costs to remove a country. Is it worth to take it? And will that price be the collapse of your country? We see how close Iran, in my opinion, is to collapse right now. It is close. I'm not saying it's a, it's going to collapse at any moment, but if we were to see an Iranian, a general Iranian invasion of Kurdistan up here, this part of Kurdistan. Um, and if it were to go swimmingly well, you know, tanks roll in, everybody breaks out Iranian flags and go, yay, 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 we're Iranians now. Okay, that'll be great for Iran. But if there's a lot of deaths and it's and it's hard fighting and there's, you know, even though it might not be on, on Iranian TV, but it would get out through the internet. Because um, I know at least one guy who um, who is in Iran who watches my ch channel regularly. Now I have zero viewers in Iran, according to YouTube, but he watches. He's in Iran. And he could be lying to me, but I think he's getting out through a VPN. So there are 
Iranians that are that watch YouTube. It doesn't show up on the stats because it shows up that they're coming from I don't know Saudi Arabia, or the um, Qatar, um, uh, um, UEA or whatever um, down here. You know, it shows up as coming from a different country. So lots of deaths and taking Iran in another sort, I mean, taking um, Kurdistan would be sort of like another Iran-Iraq war. And I think that would, would um, collapse current day um, Iranian state. And so what is the price of Kurdistan? Turkey is having enough trouble trying to mess around in, inside of um, Syria. Enough trouble with controlling parts of um Cyprus, enough trouble radicalizing its its society into more extremist Islamic viewpoint. And so, and we've had that one major coup attempt against the, the Turkish government, if you remember. I mean, it was, it was a close run thing, I think, that they almost got, what's his name, in charge of um, Turkey, and that, that fell. And there was also some other major protests a few years ago, in um, mainly coming out of Istanbul. Um, so if Turkey was going to try to grab that up, there could, it could collapse the Turkic government. Could even be an army revolt again. Um, so, you know, that's sort of the, the, the thing. And from the American standpoint, we saw... George W. Bush go from a super high support on the American populist level down to one of the most hated presidents in America because of Iraq, not because of Afghanistan. Um, the American people might not always like everything that's going on in Afghanistan, but since that's where the 9-11 attacks come from, that did not significantly depreciate support for the Republicans. It was... Not the early stages of the Iraq War. It was the second stage of the Iraq War that radically reduced popular support for Bush and the Republicans. So it doesn't obviously bring down the whole American governmental system, but it re, you know he he made it through his one re-election. But if there was going to be a third re-election, or if the timing was changed so that it, his popularity had gone down for his next re-election, he would not have been re-elected. Um, JP, I, I think there's, there is a truth to that, but my understanding is that goes back to before the um, uh, invasion of Kuwait. Um, and it wasn't, now maybe wanting to please the West, but it was before Kuwait was such a puppet state of America. And see, and I, and I think there is some pressure on Kuwait to behave well towards women and other things, you know, like, hey, you want to keep America sweet? Don't um, don't have a journalist come into your um, consulate and murder them there, you know, um, you know. So so people in America were getting upset over some school children that were bombed um, in the um, Yemen civil war. And it is a civil war, folks. It isn't Saudi Arabia's invasion of Yemen. It was the legitimate government of Yemen that everybody in the world recognized, basically, and a group of radicals from up here that, that moved into Sana'a and, and took it over the, because the capital moved there when it, when it was united, the north and south Yemen were united. And um, the faction down here was supported by Saudi, the, the government was supported by Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia has gotten deeper and deeper into their own sort of quagmire of Vietnam. People will be upset with how aggressive and how the war is being fought in um, Yemen. But we still capture ships at sea loaded full of weapons that left Iran and were headed for um, ports controlled by the rebels. That's because we still have our anti-piracy patrols out here in this part of the world, getting back to JP's naval power. Um, so we know that this is being fed and run by Iran. So the U.S. government can sell weapons 
is not causing the war and it may end the war shorter and, and make it make the make peace happen and less deaths happen sooner but may not i don't know we're selling weapons to saudi arabia but that is now in danger because of their bad behavior over the khashoggi guy okay and yeah I, i'm sure there is an, an element of that for kuwait you know don't don't make headlines for bad behavior towards anybody and we'll be sweet and we'll make sure that Kuwait stays a nice peaceful place. You can lock up your radical Islamic dissidents if you think they're going to cause terror problems or other sort of things like that, but have a good excuse for doing it, and we're all good. And, and I, I, I think that's very legitimate on all sides. And so that kind of thing. So that's that's the way I view that. I know this is sort of long on to um, Django's question about America policing the world. I think America is good for the world. Um, sort of gotten a, eh, a bit of a fight on Twitter just uh, with a, somebody said, I have po you know, posted something. We apologize to the world for Trump's behavior. We're trying to get rid of him as soon as possible to the world. And how, you know, like, and so I sort of, yeah, yeah, okay. So you're, you're standing with the, with the Russians, the Iranians, the Chinese, um, and a late, few other people against the American people. That's good. And so went back and forth a little bit. I was pleasant through the whole thing. But, you know, the, the left in America thinks the world hates Trump. Trump is beloved in Japan and beloved in Korea because when Obama was president, um, North Korea was shooting missiles over Japan. They're no longer doing that. Now, they still may be in there going around and around about their nuclear program, and it hasn't been dismantled yet. So Trump hasn't either officially ended the, the Korean War yet, nor completely disarmed um, North Korea of all of its nuclear weapons. Hasn't done that. But he's got them stopped launching and testing um, uh, ballistic missiles of any sort of size. Now, I was going to say ICBMs because they're not necessarily intercontinental intercontinental ballistic missiles and just maybe continental ballistic missiles but um he's got them to stop testing okay and we have not given them large sums of cash or opened up trade to them or you know throw you know we've we thrown them we, th we threw we threw them a party in singapore come down and hang out with trump in in singapore for for a day that's all we did. And yeah, okay, gives him respect, and he can put that on his news media that the leader of Korea has met with the leader of the world, and, you know, and they can, you know, okay, so it's a bit of a propaganda victory for him, but that's all. Oh, yeah, no, no, and, and I, I agree with you, but I, I think it's, it's, it's a mix of things, JP. But yeah, no, I, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just sort of going that I saw the signs there beforehand. And so that's probably why we were so willing to fight for them. They weren't some terrible regime that um, was being crushed. But yeah, so um, in parts of the world, the governments, and I think in India, both the Indian people and Azaz could correct me because obviously he's there if I'm wrong. But I think the general, the, the Indian government likes Trump and Trump's world policies. Um, you know, it's not like the Indian government, the Indian government doesn't like us there um, because of Trump. Um, now, the Chinese government, eh, they're not too happy. I think the Vietnamese government likes Trump. So there's a lot of places out in the world that like Trump, not just like America, but like Trump as president of the America. And I think the left doesn't realize that. Well, this episode's gone on long enough. We're going to end the episode here. I want to thank you for watching. Thanks for liking. See you next time for more Hearts of Iron.